Hello, my name is Chris Baines, and I'm an engineer on the Android Developer Relations team. Uh, I'm Rohan. I'm a PM on the Android System UI team. Uh, we're going to be talking to you about going at Shudge. Uh, so for those of you who don't know what the term is, uh, we'll get into that. But I kind of want to set the stage a little bit um, and talk about navigation. So about five months ago at uh, Google I.O., we talked about gesture navigation, uh, introducing it as an initial version in beta. And since then, we've done a lot of work to improve it, um, worked with a lot of, lot of device makers to basically standardize a lot of that uh, across the entire ecosystem. So just kind of want to give you an update. Um, basically, with Q, uh, almost all of our major device makers will be shipping with gestures on their device. Just want to give you a quick idea of the scope of the problem. Um, uh, this is super exciting for us. And the, the main gesture system that they will be shipping here is the one that you saw at I.O., where you, know, you swipe from the bottom to go home. You swipe from the left and right edge to go back. And uh, you can swipe and hold from the bottom to go to recents. So what does this mean for Android Q? Um, basically, you'll be seeing two nav modes in Q. So this is the three-button mode that most Android folks really, really love. And then this new gesture nav mode, which is meant to be a little faster uh, and more responsive. So three-button mode, one of the big changes for Q, as you may have heard before, is that it will now be required on all devices. There's a lot of accessibility needs around it. And frankly, some people just hate gestures. Uh, so we definitely acknowledge that. And I think that's something we want to keep as a staple in Android. Uh, gesture nav will optionally be available. And you know, most of our device makers are picking it up. But it can be the default like out-of-box experience. Or it can be just you know, another mode that a user can pick from settings. So now kind of putting this into context for this talk, uh, going at Judge, what does all this mean to you? Like, why is any of this really important for you? So a lot of the, the, the reasoning or, or motivation behind Gesture Nav came from users wanting more immersive experiences on their phones. And one way we did that was taking it, approaching it from a system perspective by introducing gestures, you know, getting rid of the nav bar a little bit more. And now it's kind of more up to apps to, to bring that delightful experience to users. It's something that users see as competitive and genuinely a good user experience. A second part of why you should care is gestures. Well, gestures are going to have some level of conflict with your app. So we want to make sure you're well prepared. So this talk will kind of be going into how you can make sure your app is nav ready. Um, there are two things that we'll be talking about here. The first one will be going edge to edge, which uh, Chris will go into. And the second one will be handling gesture conflicts, which I'll take over. Cool, so I want to hand it over to Chris. Thanks, Rowan. Um, so yeah, so Rowan just mentioned the term edge to edge. Now, it's kind of a weird term, so what does it actually mean? Um, so by, by this, um, if you create an Android app using Android Studio and using the new template, you'll get something like this, uh, where you, the bounds of your app are below the status bar and above the navigation bar. Now, what we want going forward with Edge to Edge is for that navigation bar to disappear and for your app's content to shine through behind it. So when the user scrolls, it looks a bit like this. Your content's scrolling behind the nav bar, drawn right to the bottom of the device screen. Um, so drawn behind the navigation bar is now strongly recommended on Android 10. We're not saying it's mandatory, but really you should be looking at doing it. Um, it's optional before Q. Uh, when you run on sort of devices before Android 10, it's optional. Um, but a lot of the work you need to do to make it work for Android 10 is also applicable for before that. So it's your choice, but you kind of already put the work in anyway. Similarly, for the top of the screen, we just want something similar, uh, where the status bar background disappears, again, allowing your content to shine through. Slightly different here. Um, oh, again, the content shining behind, showing behind, behind as you scroll, but the recommendations are not quite as strong. Uh, it depends on the type of content you have. If you tend to have a lot of imagery near the top of the screen, it works. If you just have lists of items, probably not. Again, optional before Q. Um, so we just talked about what edge to edge is. Now let's talk about how we actually get there. So there's three main steps to going edge to edge, uh, which we'll go through now in turn. The first one is changing the system bar colors. So the first thing to know is that the system, as in Android 10, the system, will help you going forward. Um, so here you can see that as the user scrolls, the navigation bar behind it is actually changing color based on the content behind it, allowing the user to actually see that bar behind that dark content. That is what we call dynamic color adaption. 
So it's one of the forms of protection for the content, um, which the system provides for you. The second type is of uh, a translucent screen, which you can see here at the bottom. So as the user scrolls, um, there's like a translucent uh, background behind the navigation bar to protect the content, allowing the user to see it. Now, the one, uh, this is shown on button mode. So if the device is set to button mode, this is all will be shown. But the one gotcha to this is that the translucent screen will only be shown if your target SDK is 29 or above. Um, so this is one reason that you also need to start testing on all navigation modes, as well as the different API levels. Um, we also then need to tell the system that we actually want to change our system bar colors. You as apps are in control of that color, and by default, it goes to color primary dark or black uh, for the navigation bar. So to actually see that content behind, we need to tell the system that we want it to be transparent. And um, we can do that using the navigation bar color attribute. Now, because we're only talking about really Android 10 here, and that's the strong recommendation, uh, we've set it in our values v29 folder. But if you're supporting back to um, pre-Android um, 10 as well, you might use it in your values. Now, before Android 10, because the system isn't responsible for that uh, background protection, you need to do it yourself. Um, and you can do that using a transparent color, a translucent color. Um, in your light theme, you'd use typically a translucent white. Um, or in your dark theme, uh, you'd use a translucent black instead. 70% tends to be a good value to start from, um, but it depends on the content that you have in your app. If you have a lot of imagery, you might need to bump the alpha value up. Um, if it's just text, you can probably bring it down, but play with it as you need. Uh, the second step is that you need to be request to be laid out full screen. As we said earlier, normally you'd be uh, displayed below the status bar and above the navigation bar, and we want to uh, go full bleed to the whole device height. Um, we're going to use the Set System UI Visibility API, um, which has been around for many, many years, um, using three special flags. Um, there's Layout Hide Navigation, which tells the system that we want to be laid out as if the navigation bar wasn't there. Um, so behind it is what it results in. Uh, the second one is Layout Full Screen, and that's a similar story, but for the, the top of the screen, the status bar. Um, and then there's a special flag called Layout Stable. Um, I'll point you to the docs and look at what this special flag does. Um, but the API, as in the set system UI visibility API, it takes a number of flags, um, and it can affect how it works. So have a look. But the, the, thing, the key takeaway from this is that these, these three special flags are what you need to use. So once we've done that, we go from this to something like this. Um, but you can see that the fab, the floating action button, that bottom right, is now being displayed behind the navigation bar, which isn't great. Um, and that leads on to step three, which is avoiding overlaps with the system UI. And that brings us on to the topic of insets. Now, insets is a term tends to strike fears into the hearts of developers. <laughs> insets, at the most simple, are just a collection of values that tell you how to move something in by. Kind of the inverse of an inset would be like a safe area. Um, and what content to move depends on the inset type. We have a number of types, which we'll go through now. Um, how you use or how you actually um, apply them changes. So let's go through them. The first step is called system window insets. Now, these have been available in the framework since like, API 1, very, very old. Um, and they tell you where on screen uh, the system UI is being displayed above your app, as in, in the Z order. Um, they are typically used to move clickable views out of the way. So if you, that fab example we spoke about earlier, um, we typically have this. So here we've got a fab at the bottom right, and you typically have 16 dips of margin on it, which are denoted by the arrows. Um, now, you can see here that it's slightly overlapping the navigation bar, which isn't the end of the world, but it's not great. Really, we want to move it up and so that the fab is nowhere near the navigation bar. It's much more obvious in button mode, um, as you can see here, um, because the fab is being pretty much overlapped by the navigation bar in, in its entirety, and the user can't click on it. Um, so really, what we want to do is push it up. And we do that using the system window insets. That's the value you use. Uh, the next gesture, uh, inset type is called system gesture insets. And now these are new in Android 10. Uh, and they represent the areas of the window where the system gestures, the gestures that Roman spoke about earlier, take priority over your app. Um, so visually, they look a bit like this. Um, on the vertical edges, we have the back gesture. So as you swipe in from the left or right edge, um, the back arrow comes in, and the, the user can go back. Or from the bottom of the screen, the user can go home and by swiping up from the bottom. Um, in terms of how you use them, they're typically used to move draggable views out of the way. Um, but we'll go for an example of that later. Uh, the final gesture um, system inset we're going to talk about is the mandatory system gestures. 
Um, now, these are a subset of gesture insets, and you wouldn't typically use them directly. Um, but apps, which Roman will talk about in a bit, um, apps have a, actually effect on where the gestures can work. Uh, they have APIs where you can actually tell the system, I don't want it to work here. Um, the mandatory system gesture insets tell you where that API doesn't work. Um, the system keeps the, these gesture areas um, available only, only to the user. Um, currently in Android 10, that represents the bottom area, the home gesture. Um, and that is because it should always be an escape hatch for the user. Uh, the, an app should never be able to trap a user in their app. Uh, so as a quick summary, system window insets, clickable views, gesture insets, draggable views, mandatory system ge gesture insets, you wouldn't typically use directly. Um, so we just talk about gesture insets, and now let's talk about how you actually avoid overlaps. So we're going to use the view compat API, uh, specifically for the apply window insets method. So window insets an API which has been around for a while now. Um, now, you can set a listener on a view, and then the next inset traversal, what will happen, that listener will be called. And from there, we can do something with those insets. Um, one tip, actually going back, one tip to, uh, is that you should always try and use the view compact method. Uh, the API for window insets has changed over the years. Uh, the API now matches what we have in Android 10. So you'll get the same API from the framework that you would all the way back to API 14. Um, and it also has some uh, fixes from bugs, for, for bugs in the framework. So make sure you try and use that. Um, in terms of window insets, there are three main methods you're going to use, and they map directly to the different types of insets we spoke about earlier. The return type is an insets object, um, which is just a value type which has a left, a top, a right, and a bottom. Um, the values are ints, and they represent pixel values of the size of the inset from the edge. So the top one will be, say, I don't know, 40 pixels from the top edge inwards, and same for the upper edges. So let's go for a very quick example. Here we have a very simple app and we're gonna go apply all of our changes. So the first thing we're gonna do is change our navigation bar color, and we get this, so you can see that the, navig the navigation bar is gone. Secondly, we're gonna go, um, sorry, we're gonna set, uh, wanna be laid out full screen, so we're gonna use the system UI visibility method, and then we get laid out behind it. But you can see that the bottom navigation, the view, is being overlapped by the navigation bar. So we wanna fix that. So we're gonna set an on apply window insets listener, um, and from there, once we get some insets, we're gonna just add some padding. And once we've done that, we go run padding. And then once we've done that, we'll go from this to this, which, you know, kind of looks good. Um, padding tends to be what you want to use on a view because you wanna move the content in rather than the actual view itself. Um, but you could also use margin. So in the fab example we showed earlier, you probably want to move the whole view up rather than actually use padding. Um, so yeah, you can also use uh, layout. And it will look a bit like this. So let's go for a slightly more complex, uh, complicated example, uh, which is a button bar. Typically, you might have seen this from like Google Photos. Um, visually, it looks a bit like this um, in terms of its background. And how it's implemented is a very simple horizontal linear layout with 32, 32 dips of padding. Um, but after applying all of our steps, we get this instead, which obviously doesn't look the same. We've lost all of our bottom padding. Um, and the reason for this is that because we're using update padding in our on apply window insets, uh, in our listener, uh, we're actually wiping out that 32 dips from the layout, which is not what we want to do. The 32 dips of padding from the layout is our intention, it's what the design is, so we want to keep it. So one way around this is that you could actually record the padding outside the listener and then just add them together within the listener. And we get this instead. So once we've done that, uh, you can see that the 32 tits of padding is still there, but we've also moved the view up from the actual uh, navigation bar size. Uh, we actually wrote a blog post that goes into far more detail over the kind of ways you can work around this um, and better things like you can use data binding or even copying extension functions. Uh, so make sure we check out that article if you want to know more. I'm going to hand to Rome to talk about gesture conflicts. Thanks, Chris. Cool. So Chris quickly talked about uh, Edge to Edge. Um, I'm going to cover the second part of it, which is handling gesture conflicts. So it's going to be hyper-focused on gesture nav now as opposed to just you know, any sort of nav mode. Um, but the one I want to talk about is the left and right edge conflicts. Those are the most interesting ones for devs. Uh, there's, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of conflict that folks have called out um, in our beta. So I want to make sure you get a good picture of this. So in gesture nav, as we kind of talked um, about, swiping from either edge will take the user back. Uh, in immersive mode, it's a little interesting too, and I'll cover that after this. 
But basically, any sort of UI that you have at the edge can become a problem. So in the case of this example here, uh, I have photos with four crop handles. If a user wants to crop a picture, you know, they would suddenly start going back instead of being able to crop a picture. So this is the, kind of the core idea. We wanted to make sure that some small swipeable elements had some way of uh, taking over the back gesture space. So uh, Q in the exclusion rect API. Um, we're introducing this in, uh, in Android Q or Android 10. And basically it allows you to opt out a small part of each edge for app use. So in this case, it might look like this, where you have the green rectangles uh, as the areas that you may opt out of. Now, one, one really important note is this API should be used super sparingly. Uh, this is not meant to be like a free-for-all or, or you know, meant to be used for like carousels. Uh, it's more for drag handles, seek bars, little small toggles um, where the user will want to swipe. Uh, the, the reason, there's a lot of reasoning behind this, but roughly users love back in Android. Um, I think users go back over twice as much as home, uh, almost 300 times a day. And that's super important uh, or per user, of course. Uh, it's super important for us, uh, and we want to maintain that consistency and keep back as a staple of Android. So what does this look like? Um, it's a new method in the view class. Uh, it's set system gesture exclusion rects, kind of a mouthful. Um, but roughly, it takes in a list of rectangles in the view's coordinate space that reflect or relay which areas uh, the view should get touch events for instead of being used for the system. And you can use this in on layout. Uh, and if you want more of a per frame update, uh, you can also use this in on draw. Now, I want to talk about that restriction from earlier. Um, you know, I mentioned that we don't want this to be used for uh, you know, every single large scale UI. So one of the things with Q is there is a restriction on this API. Uh, basically, apps can only opt out of 200 dips on either edge, or rather, uh, on each edge, you can opt out of a to total of 200 dips. So if apps do opt out of more, then only the bottom 200 would get respected. Um, I, w I did want to visually explain this really quick. So in the photos example, you can see the blue areas are where I, as a developer, uh, decided to put in those, or use that exclusion rect API. What the system will do is it'll only count, um, uh, oh, it's updating, here we go. Here we go. Uh, it'll only count the, the bottom 200, uh, which are highlighted in green. The top blue part, the rest of what I re requested, will just get dropped off. Okay, now switching tracks a little bit, I want to talk about immersive mode and how back and uh, this API kind of interact with it. So in gesture nav, here's kind of how immersive mode behaves. Um, any swipe from an edge will first trigger in the status bar and navigation bar. So what this looks like is if you swipe from the left, right, um, top, or bottom, uh, you'll notice that the status bar and the gesture nav bar will come in. After these bars come in, uh, any subsequent swipe will actually do the gesture itself. So swiping from the bottom will go home, Swiping from the left or right will go back. Now, how this kind of works with that back API, um, basically, uh, it, the restriction still kind of applies here. So, for example, if you're, uh, if you're in the Photos app, you can you know, use that 200 dip API, and that'll also stop the user from swiping in the navigation bar and status bar. Sticky Immersive is a bit of a special case here, though. Um, there are a couple of use cases that Chris will go into uh, in his blogs, but basically they need that entire edge to be used for their app. So Sticky Immersive, uh, it has unlimited exclusion on the left and right edge. So apps can utilize the entire uh, length of it for things like games mainly. Cool, and then I want to let Chris talk about the blog super quick. Yeah, let's finish off. Um, so we released a number of blog posts uh, in a mini series on gesture nav. Um, it goes much more into detail about all the stuff we talk about today. So going from edge to edge, but also the gesture exclusion uh, subject. And so we've got a flow chart which you can easily read and actually define what you actually want to do. So go check that out. Um, and as a quick TLDW, um, we've got a little one here. So uh, yeah, read this in your own time on the on live stream later. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>